Uh, thank you very much. An interesting discussion. Uh, now, mention was made that uh, you know the, the fuel of the future is very uncertain. Uh, we're now going to have a discussion about one potential fuel of the future. It's nuclear. And I'd like to invite uh, Mikhail uh, Boe, CEO of Core Power, please. Mikhail. Thank you very much, Kevin. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mikhail Bo. I'm the founder and CEO of Core Power, and we're building a market for new nuclear in maritime. And the title of my presentation today is New Nuclear for Maritime, the Environmental and Economic Disruptor. And I've chosen this title really in the hope that I can tempt you all to start thinking a little differently about how things are and how things are going to be. Because to solve tomorrow's challenges, we must change the way we think of our energy use. Those challenges are not just about the environment, but about the economics of our industry. Shipping is the most fiercely competitive industry we know, and for a long time we've been on a race towards zero, towards zero emissions, and as we've heard at many times towards zero margins. Nuclear has been beaten up since the 1980s with fear and mistrust fostered by those who would profit from its demise. And these two industries, shipping and nuclear, both essential to the future of human prosperity, are both ripe for disruption. I believe new nuclear will have a very important role to play in tomorrow's maritime, and we believe that maritime will have a very important role to play in tomorrow's nuclear. And here's why. The global push for a transition to clean energy and an environmentally sustainable ocean transportation sector will, at the end of the day, come down to the matters of energy density and energy efficiency. Simply put, the more fuel we use, the more waste we produce. And conversely, the less fuel we use, the less waste we produce. The waste varies, but it's still waste. That's why energy content matters. Our current low sulfur IFR 380 contains an average of 41 megajoules per kilo. That's about 11 megawatt hours per tonne of fuel consumed. Our industry's focus on synthetic fuels made from green hydrogen contains less than half of that energy or bunker fuel. Green methanol contains approximately 20 megajoules per kilo and green ammonia slightly less. So our industry's transition to this end of the energy spectrum would therefore result in a more than 100% increase in our fuel consumption and with a corresponding increase in our waste and emissions footprint. Nuclear fuel from uranium, which has been safely and efficiently used in power generation and the nuclear navies since the 1950s, contains 80 million megajoules per kilo, equivalent of 22 million megawatt hours per tonne of fuel. Just for easy comparison, that's roughly 4 million times more energy per tonne of fuel than the proposed alternatives. Now, physics, and we can't argue with physics, it tells us that the quantity of fuel and the fuel efficiency guide the quantity of waste that we produce. Unused carbon in the exhaust from burning or bunker fuel mixes with oxygen in the air and creates approximately 3.2 tons of CO2 per tonne of bunkers consumed. That's how we, as an industry, supply 2.5% of the 50 billion tons of CO2 released into the air every year by, com by combusting fossil fuels. Green ammonia and methanol would improve emissions on a per ton basis, but because of the low energy content, we would double our use of fuel and hence our emissions. With nuclear fuel, since we use so infinitely little of it, we produce only negligible quantities of waste, and this waste, whilst toxic and harmful if ingested, is never released into the environment, like we do with exhaust gases. And if it's not delivered or ingested, it is logically not harmful to us. If we are to produce a smaller quantity of waste than emissions, we must use a smaller quantity of fuel. Not less fuel by going slower, but less of a better fuel so we can go faster. Going faster on less fuel, logically, would improve our economics. Now, since January 
1954, there have been over 700 reactors built and operated around the world. And about half of these have been operated at sea. We know that it works really well. So when our industry thinks of nuclear power, it naturally thinks of naval reactors. But we must think differently. Naval reactors are not suited to commercial use. That's why we don't have nuclear ships today. The benefits of naval reactors include millions of miles without refueling, true zero emissions, and because the reactor acts as the energy storage, we don't need fuel tanks, which gives us more space for cargo. But the features of naval reactor make them unsuitable for shipping. They're highly pressurized, which means that we must maintain a large evacuation zone around them, which makes port calls all but impossible. The fuel is highly enriched, which is a showstopper for civilian life. How they operate is a tightly kept military secret, and we cannot therefore create a civilian commercial market for them. Like I said, we need to think differently. So, new nuclear can be a game changer. If we, so if we see this differently, we can see that a way to get the same benefits from a new set of features that are suited to our needs. In other words, our, nuclear, our new nuclear for maritime must be fit for purpose. So using unpressurized reactors means that we can shrink the evacuation zone down to just potentially the boundary of the vessel. Operate the liability would then go from being a huge public liability to a simple one, covered by marine insurance. We can use civilian grade, low enriched fuels, which are acceptable for commercial use. In a fast molten salt reactor, probably the most exciting new energy invention since the diesel engine, we can use those fuels so efficiently that we don't need to refuel for 30 years. And that extreme fuel efficiency and the small quantity of fuel combine to produce very little waste. Importantly, we can, for the very first time, also manufacture these new reactors as a small mass-assembled product. Assembly line production means better construction, higher quality insurance. So moving from project to product in nuclear is a real revolution for that industry. Now, the evacuation zone around any reactor really matters. We call it the EPZ, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, emergency planning zone. And it's one of the primary reasons why, new nuclear, why nuclear, as we know it today, has not been adopted in the shipping industry. It's essentially the difference between an unlimited liability of maintaining a large EPZ versus the limited liability of maintaining a small EPZ contained within the boundaries of the vessel. Now, the examples you see here are illustrative of this point. With a large EPZ, the operator of the vessel would be responsible for evacuation and cleanup of the area in a port or a whole port city in case of an accident. Now, with a small contained EPZ, that liability would not extend beyond the railings of the ship and could be covered by marine insurance. There's a big, big difference. Now, in waterways, as you can see on the right, where the EPZ is moving with the vessel, the large EBZ is an almost inconceivable liability burden for even the largest vessel operators. Again, a small EPZ, not beyond the boundaries of the hull, changes all that. Now, since we went from sail to steam in the 1860s, shipping alone has poured over 1,000 billion tons of high-energy fossil fuels through our engines and released over 3 trillion tons of exhaust gases into the atmosphere. And all of that fuel, every single ton, had a zero residual value. Not only that, it turns out that pollution costs. Accounting for well to wake, fossil fuels, in fact, have a negative residual value. Now, what makes the fast molten salt reactor a real disruptor is, however, the positive residual value of the fuel. And here's how. Instead of stopping the reactors at refueling intervals to remove the spent fuel and load fresh fuel, the fast MSR, which runs on a liquid nuclear fuel, is topped up at full power. We don't stop, 
We don't produce any emissions. And the little re residual waste, equivalent to the amount being topped up, we extract from the core and store securely inside the reactor island with no harm to anyone. And this means that the tank is always full. What went into the reactor on day one is still there intact on the last day. At 2.5% inflation, an asset, all else being equal, would double in value over 30 years. So with a 30-year ship life, or on a floating production platform or for synthetic bunker fuels, powered by a fast MSR, the energy in the reactor, again, all else being equal, could double in value. In this particular example, I'm using a $100 million asset based on a nuclear-powered Newcastle Max, a $150 million reactor, and $250 million worth of fuel inventory. And that's a capex of $500 million. It's a large sum. But consuming bunker fuels, that same ship with a $60 million capex, fuel at $600 a ton plus carbon taxes at, say, $100, which is roughly what the EU ETS is today, would cost roughly the same, $500 million in combined capex and opex over that period. And consuming green synthetic fuels, like ammonia, methanol, that's being discussed today, we would estimate that cost to quadruple to $2 billion, not $500 million. So the economics of that same ship powered by a fast MSR has the residual value of the nuclear fuel going from $250 million on day one to $500 million at the end. And as per industry practice, some value would be set aside for reactor decommissioning, OPEX, maintenance, et cetera, be included, as well as specialist insurance. The liquid nuclear fuel would then be drained from the reactor at the end and loaded into a next generation of fast MSRs for reuse for another 30 years, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, financing that nuclear fuel becomes a very different proposition, and we advocate for leasing. Very few, if any, commercial vessel operators would become licensed nuclear operators, at least today. With leasing of fuel, energy, and the reactor systems, we can include the license, the liability insurance, specialized reactor operate, operators, and the maintenance of the system in the price. And here you can see the potential depreciation of the fuel for financing purposes, and the actual potential value of the fuel under 2.5% inflation. And it shows a lease margin, the spread between the actual and financeable value in which we can construct a viable leasing model, which here shows at $300 million. That's roughly 60% of the original capex. Now, the EU taxonomy allows nuclear to be financed by green bonds. The US government is encouraging investment in new nuclear. Japan, UK, India, China, Brazil, Canada are all encouraging private investment in the nuclear fuel cycle. And we want sustainability across the board, both environmentally and economically. Ladies and gentlemen, I think here it is. Now, the fear of nuclear is always born from a lack of knowledge. It's not actually that complex. A little knowledge goes a very long way to understanding how new nuclear for maritime and, new, and maritime for new nuclear can provide the future that we need. And so to, to demonstrate the viability of new nuclear and maritime, we'll need evidence of safety functions and systems so that we can always ensure safe and secure operations even when a marine accident happens. And the UK government took the first step in December, just before Christmas, by passing the Merchant Shipping Nuclear Ships Regulation of 2022 into law. We know that from the numbers that nuclear is the safest energy source we have in the world today, and despite widespread popular belief. But, as Bellingcat says, you can't camouflage facts. Younger generations who are concerned with climate change and global warming are now discovering that new nuclear is the safest way to convert energy to power and that new nuclear technologies promise us true zero emissions and a sustainable environmental footprint. We must recognize that radiation, whether man-made or natural, is an essential part of life on our planet, and like everywhere else, everything else, from red wine to hydrochloric acid, is nothing to be feared in suitable doses. Radiation is used to cure illness, not harm. 
radiation limits set by international organizations are set so low, in fact, that they're akin to having a motorway speed limit of one mile per hour. Is that as safe as possible or as safe as reasonable? Nuclear is the only zero emission energy source we have. The finest minds, the smartest people in the world are actively engaged in technology advancements that make this new generation of nuclear machines fit for purpose so that we can use it to achieve our goals. Now, just at the end, we have on the table outside, we have a little card with a QR code on it. If you want to download this presentation and learn more about it, please pick up a card and scan the QR code and you'll get all the details you need on that. And with that, Kevin, Mia, thank you very much.